pages among young people ages 18 to 24. He also issued a new face covering order. Both are in effect immediately. So both orders are in effect through November 21st unless a superseding order is issued. So as a reminder, once the governor's order expires, Milwaukee County's mask policy requiring masks or face coverings uh, to be worn in all county buildings, facilities, grounds, or other places where services are delivered, they will remain in effect. Uh, last week, uh, we launched a, a small business recovery initiative grant program. Uh, these grants are designed to support businesses that have been adversely affected uh, by the COVID-19 virus. And so applications will be accepted through October 1st at 5 p.m. That is the deadline. So get your applications in as fast as you can. And if you want to learn more and want to apply, visit our Milwaukee County webpage at Milwaukee count, excuse me, county.milwaukee.gov. I'm also happy to announce the new mortgage assistance program for Milwaukee County homeowners who are facing mortgage delinquency or foreclosure due to the financial hardships as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we all know that home ownership is a key social determinant of health. So for the health of our residents and the health of our community, the Mortgage Assistance Program is a critical initiative. Uh, the Milwaukee County Housing Division is partnering with Housing Resources Inc. to provide this assistance through CARES Act funding dollars that we have received. The applications are being accepted now through December 18th. And, and, and if you don't know what today is, today is National Voter Registration Day. And it's a good reminder to make sure that we are all registered to vote in this upcoming election. So to check your registration or request an absentee ballot, please visit uh, myvote.wi.gov. And a little later in the briefing, you know, when we think about COVID-19, it really has had a, a major impact on, on mental health as well as the opioid crisis. And so you're gonna hear from Valerie Vidal, uh, president and CEO of Meta House, uh, who will talk about the recovery. Uh, we've seen a rise in opioid, opioid uh, uh, use and substance abuse uh, as people cope with feelings and, and the isolation and the stress uh, due to this pandemic. And so she'll have the opportunity to talk about some of the resources that are available to those who may be struggling with addiction. And finally, um, I want to once again thank Commissioner Kowalik for her leadership at the Milwaukee Health Department, uh, especially with this being her last day, and I'm glad that she's able to join us, uh, but I also want to welcome uh, Ms. Marlena Jackson, who will be serving as interim commissioner in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, thank you to Commissioner Kowalik and uh, interim direct in interim commissioner uh, Jackson for your leadership and guidance uh, during these tough times. Um, and I also want to say thank you for Mayor Baird for his leadership as well and hand it off to him. Well, thank you very much, Mr. County Executive. Um, and it's great to be working with you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I am very happy to also welcome our Interim Commissioner of Health, Marlena Jackson, on the call today. Um, thank you very much for being with us today, Marlena. She's done a great job. She's worked closely with schools and other organizations throughout this, and uh, she is going to hit the ground running. Um, obviously, I'm going to be sad to see Jeanette Kowalik leave. So, Madam Commissioner, I, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank you for your time as Commissioner of the City of Milwaukee Health Department. Um, you've done an outstanding job during this very, very difficult time for our city, and we're grateful for your service. So best of luck in the new chapter of your life in DC, and don't forget us here in your, your hometown. Now I wanna give a, a brief update on the COVID-19 in our community. Dr. Weston will go much more into depth, but I have the news of reporting that our testing numbers have gone up. The number of people that have been tested has gone up and we are meeting our benchmark of 2000 tests performed each day. We're happy to see an increase in the number of people being tested. Um, and it's very important that we continue testing to measure the spread of the virus in our community and understand our true positivity rate. Um, our National Guard testing numbers as of Monday, as of yesterday, UMOS on the South Side, really a stellar day, over 1,000 people, 1,037 individuals came through and got tested there yesterday. On the north side, 495 at Custer, that's higher than normal as well. That brings the week's total to 1552. Um, I also wanna share with you the five-day average. Uh, the five-day average for our positivity rate is now 7%. That's higher than I like to see. Um, it tells us that we are beginning to see um, an uptick in positive cases of COVID-19 in the city of Milwaukee. And that's troubling to me. We were below 5% there for a little bit and we had hoped that we'd continue to stay there. Um, so I remain concerned about that. 
I know that there's always a lot of questions um, about COVID-19 and we want to continue to act as a resource for that. So ask yourself, what questions do you have about COVID-19? Um, because for our briefing on Thursday, we want to answer those questions. Um, ask them on social media on either my Facebook page at Mayor Barrett or my Twitter page at Mayor of MKE. Um, and we will be prepared to answer those questions on Thursday. I also, also want to pay a um, uh, Thank you to Meta House. I've been a long time, huge, huge fan of Meta House. Um, and I'm pleased that we have Valerie Vidal of Meta House joining us today. Meta House is a local organization, a great organization, if you're not familiar with it, that's doing the very important work of addressing substance abuse in our community. Substance abuse is a serious issue that has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The city and the county also provide help to individuals struggling with addiction through the Milwaukee Overdose Initiative, the Mori Initiative, which is a partnership between and our fire department. Uh, the, it also involves community, a partnership with community health centers, uh, addiction counselors, and social service agencies. Um, so Mori utilizes opioid-related overdose data from the fire department to initiate a rapid response by a trained community paramedic and peer support specialist to engage clients in treatment and recovery services following an overdose. The initiative began back in January of 2019, and it started at just four hours a day, four days a week, but peer support specialists voluntarily joined community paramedics to visit with individuals uh, who had overdosed and, and offered to connect them to resources. Now in its second phase, Maury, uh, I'm pleased to announce, received a $735,000 grant from the National Association of County and City Health Officials in November of 2019 that allowed us, uh, allowed the initiative to move to eight hours a day for six days a week with pay for peer support specialists. We've now reached a milestone of over 400 individuals or their families after an overdose to offer treatment and support. And now we've reached the third phase of Maury. The National Association of County and City Health Officials again extended its contract and provided the initiative with an additional $500,000. In other words, they're a believer. They see what we're doing, they see the value in it. And with this support, Maury was able to hire a social worker to work full time in the medical examiner's office as a community resource dispatcher for post fatal overdoses. The long term outcome of this addition is to prevent trauma and increase resiliency in our residents. Since the safer at home order went into effect, we have added safety protocols for in-person visits and telehealth options to make sure that anyone who wants to meet with the Mori team can do so safely. This is the first program of its kind in Wisconsin, one of the first in the nation, uh, and it's really, really there to offer individual help when they need it most. Um, finally, I'd like to end by acknowledging that today is National Voter Registration Day. Following this briefing, I will be heading to Miller Park to join the Election Commission at just one of the sites, at just one of the sites today where voters can receive assistance and register to vote. Across the entire country, National Voter Registration Day is a reminder to all eligible voters to consider their voter registration status prior to the upcoming elections. The City Election Commission is doing a great job in encouraging a greater and easier level of access to voting. We're doing so by expanding in-person absentee or early voting, by streamlining our, in, our by mail absentee voting process. We've installed absentee ballot drop boxes around the city, um, and we've had a return to neighborhood-based voting following the pandemic that we um, saw the big disruption in April. It's also important to have the dissemination of accurate and reliable information to the public and the Election Commission is committed to that. So please make sure your family members, your neighbors, and your friends are registered to vote. This election, more than any other, is about preparation. Get vote ready by registering to vote and creating your voting plan today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Weston, who's done just a phenomenal job over the last six months in in working with all of us. Dr. Weston. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon. Uh, first, as always, to our numbers, we have had 27,124 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our community and 424 individuals who've died. 
When we look at the trajectory of the COVID-19 disease burden in our county and in our state, we're seeing very concerning trends. In previous months, we have talked uh, about which states were really struggling. We first talked about Washington State uh, and then New York, later Texas, Florida, and Arizona. These were the states that we looked at with concern, uh, discussed what may have gone wrong and how we could learn to prevent a similar fate here. We are now the state of concern. Wisconsin appears to have the second highest positivity rate in the country, near 20% and indicating an ongoing rise. Here in Milwaukee County, we have as of recent been able to maintain a positivity range of 7% on average, but that's beginning to rise as well in conjunction with the state. And after over two months of decline, our county daily case numbers are climbing as well. While the highest percent positive rates remain in our southern municipalities, the emerging hotspots in the county seem to be centered around UWM in particular and also Marquette University. In some cases, more than double the number of cases week over week. Certainly at a time like this, the governor's actions to extend the statewide mass mandate are absolutely critical. These are not trends that we want to see, especially entering into the colder months when respiratory infections such as COVID-19 typically expand dramatically. As a community, we must continue to be vigilant in thinking about physical distancing and masking in all of our activities. Shifting a bit, uh, our upcoming speaker will discuss another epidemic in our community, made worse by the pandemic certainly, and that is the misuse of opioids. From an EMS perspective, we've had an increase in 911 EMS calls related to overdoses in 2020 as compared to 2019 for every month that we've been in this pandemic. Moreover, if we continue down the path that we are currently on, this year we are on track for more annual opioid related deaths in Milwaukee County than we've seen in any of the last 10 years. We'll hear more about the resources available to help combat, combat the opioid epidemic shortly. Uh, next, as Mayor Barrett mentioned, we want to know what questions you have about COVID-19. I've certainly found that some of the most important and insightful questions that I hear are from family and friends. So please post question to the mayor's Facebook page. Uh, we'll work on answering as many as we can during the upcoming briefings. Finally, I've had the honor uh, and I have the honor of handing off uh, for one last time to Commissioner Kowalik as we welcome Interim Commissioner Jackson. Uh, Commissioner Kowalik, it's certainly been an honor to work with you and both gain your insight uh, and witness your impact on the city of Milwaukee and our broader community. I think that substantial positive impact is certainly felt in this pandemic, uh, but also your work on health equity, diversification of leadership, uh, your promotion of the profession of public health, and your work to overall enhance the health of our population. So I look forward to following the next phase of your career at the national level. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. And now to Commissioner Kowalik. Okay, thank you, Dr. Weston. I had to have a moment so I didn't start crying. Um, but thank you, uh, County Executive and Mayor Barrett for um, your kind words and um, it has been a challenge, but um, you know, we're passing the baton today to um, uh, Deputy Jackson, who will now be the Interim Commissioner of Health for the City of Milwaukee. So before I get to that point, I just wanted to give my standard COVID update. Uh, just to acknowledge where we're at as the city of Milwaukee and just some reminders as we move into the fall season. Today is uh, fall or autumn equinox, so the 22nd of September. Uh, what a great day to close out my career at the Milwaukee Health Department. Uh, but just again, acknowledging that winter time is coming, it's going to get colder outside and we need to make sure we're being vigilant about prevention of COVID-19. Um, as Governor Evers issued his executive order today that there needed to be uh, just an extension of the time period to November 21st. The mask wearing um, is really important. Uh, but just again, we know that there is uh, issues with gathering, especially indoors when there's poor ventilation. I know that there were a number of uh, questions yesterday when the CDC updated their guidance about um, concerns related to airborne versus droplet um, spread of COVID. This is really important. And, you know, they might change your position tomorrow. Who knows, considering what we're dealing with right now. But this is really important information because this determines what we need to do to prevent the spread of COVID-19. 
uh, we've been promoting uh, mask wearing, cloth masks. We're carrying thousands of masks. Uh, and we are very concerned because if the airborne uh, is the main mode of transmission, then we need to make sure that we're providing masks that have filters or N95s or something along those lines. I know that there was concern early on with even promoting mask wearing because there was concerns about a run on PPE and N95s that they would be um, hoarded and not available for first responders and healthcare providers. Uh, and we know that now there's more masks that are available, but we need to prepare if this is truly the case, we need to make sure that there's um, masks that will trap those particles at that level. Again, droplet bigger, uh, airborne or aerosol smaller, so you need um, more fil filtering to protect yourself from the viral material. Another thing that I wanted to just highlight again, as I'm wearing my mask because I'm outside of the house, is proper mask wearing. So again, the mask goes over your nose. <laughs> so make sure it is over your nose to the bottom of your chin. Extremely important because you need to make sure that any opportunity for um, any air or whatever is blocked from coming in and it's filtered from coming into your body. I know there's also been questions about covering your eyes, goggles and things like that, or glasses. Um, so there's still uh, lots of talk about that, depending on your level of exposure. If you're in a clinic or clinical practice or healthcare practice or first responder versus just being a normal uh, person going about your day. So uh, just continue to stay tuned for more information on that because again, COVID-19 is new for us. The strain is new for us. And we're learning more about this virus as the weeks go by. Um, as Dr. Weston noted that the state is in bad shape, we're most likely gonna be on more quarantine lists if you decide to travel. So please make sure that you are aware of these things if you're leaving the state of Wisconsin. Um, also uh, that even within the state that there's variants, Milwaukee County, the city of Milwaukee, we are faring much better than other areas of our state. Um, and we also like to say that's in part due to the fact that we still have orders in the city of Milwaukee, moving Milwaukee forward safely. I would have loved to give you the gift of being free of orders on my last day, but we started making a turn for the worse in a not in a severe uh, case as some other parts of the state, but definitely not where we needed to be to be able to lift out of these orders. I would like to see us get down to a positivity rate of less than one for at least three to four weeks to be able to move out of orders. So along the way, uh, Commissioner Jackson and the team uh, will have to evaluate the data weekly as they have and we have since the beginning of our COVID uh, outbreak and make decisions based off of that information. If things are getting better, they might make a modified order. So right now we're in 4.1 um, or if we really improve dramatically, we can move out of orders. But again, we definitely don't want to tear off the Band-Aid and then have to go back and scramble to closing things up. That's definitely not a good situation for anyone. It's very traumatizing. We've been through a lot and we definitely don't want to create such a harsh uh, reality for our community. Uh, we also know that uh, these latest increases of COVID-19 are among young adults. So 18 to 24 year olds, uh, we've also seen some in other areas of the state related to school-based outbreaks um, in executive order 90, it lists 76 uh, school-based outbreak investigations uh, among K through 12. So it's very important to make sure that we're monitoring the situation closely. You know, the city of Milwaukee again, created an opportunity for schools K through 12 and colleges and universities to submit COVID safety plans to ease into reopening that we would have these three levels of 100% virtual hybrid with some in person and then full on in person because there will be a need to move through these different phases as time goes on but we will continue to monitor this closely uh, if there needs to be a stop or halt on in-person education in our area and then also I wanted to just highlight uh, some of the issues that we have in our community because we're a regional 
um, environment. We have a regional community. So just because you're in the city of Milwaukee, either doing business or residing in the city of Milwaukee, you may uh, work or your kids may go to school outside of the city of Milwaukee where there's areas that don't have orders. So we see a lot of this cross pollination or movement, which increases the chances of infection or exposure to COVID-19 for most people. So we just wanted to highlight that again. Uh, our ability to have orders here is providing some protective effect for the rest of the region. But we also know that because other uh, communities in the region don't have orders, that eventually we will start seeing some uh, increase of our positivity rate, which is what we're seeing right now. And then um, reminders, again, I talked about masks, wearing them properly, uh, the difference between airborne or droplet. But just again, this uh, sanitation, washing your hands. Every time you uh, come in the house or come into a building, wash your hands or sanitize your hands. If at all possible, take off your shoes. Uh, don't track whatever from the outside into your house. Make sure you're cleaning high touch surfaces uh, with uh, disinfectant wipes or using, um, you can use some homemade um, uh, concoctions that are also just as efficient. Make sure you're following directions because the CDC and the state's Department of Health Services also has this information on the website of how to create these um, protective or preventive types of, of solutions if you don't have access to say Lysol or Clorox uh, wipes or anything like that. I know some of those things were out of stock. Um, the distancing again is really important, making sure you're having at least six feet between others and the time that you spend um, with other people. I know that we were still holding the line at 10 and then CDC increased it to 15 minutes, but we know that it's been nicer outside. So people have been more lax about that. We're going to be more um, focused on indoors. So make sure that you're being extremely mindful of this. Definitely always wearing your mask anytime you're outside of your house. Um, also, the airflow is very important. Uh, we know that was some of our concerns about schools reopening earlier on, that some of the schools have older HVAC systems that are not sufficient. The airflow is not what it needs to be, which can create uh, a dangerous environment for our kids. So uh, acknowledging the importance of a solid HVAC system and updated HVAC system that's working and that the filters are being changed on a regular basis. And then a last reminder that I want to give you all is related to immunity. So boosting your immune system naturally. And I said this a long time ago, but it's still very true. I feel like a grandma, but um, sleep is extremely important. You have to make sure your body is able to recharge six to eight hours or whatever is needed for your body. Um, not being dehydrated so that you're drinking adequate water, um, a gallon a day, a rule of thumb. Um, also, your diet. Uh, many of us have been uh, comfort eating because of the stress related to COVID so that you're balancing that you're getting fresh vegetables and fruit, uh, that you're getting uh, lean meats, that you're not just uh, going and getting burgers and uh, fried food every day. Um, it's definitely not good for your immune system or your heart. And of course, exercising, just going for a walk even, just getting out of the house, get, getting some fresh air is very important. And then limiting your consumption of sugars, um, alcohol, caffeine, and any other drugs that um, can make your immune system more compromised. So um, I'm not gonna go into detail about different supplements and things because I know that there's a lot of talk about like vitamin D and vitamin C and all of that. And we don't have time for all of that information, but you know, as someone that has a uh, compromised immune system, you, know, you really have to take care of your immune system and um, doing so is going to help you down the long run if you happen to be exposed to any virus, including COVID-19. So um, that's my update for COVID. Now I wanna move into the transition to Commissioner Jackson. So um, again, as a part of the rebuilding of the Milwaukee Health Department, we created this um, A team or, or leadership team, if you will, where we have a chief of staff, Lillian Payne, who is the wave maker, as I say, 
that was behind the movement to declare racism as a public health crisis through the Wisconsin Public Health Association, and then has helped many of us do it at the local level. Uh, Villian uh, came on board or returned to the health department uh, at the end of 2019. And since then, she's also received a number of awards and accolades for her work. And she was recently appointed to Governor Evers Council for Health Equity. Uh, then we have um, Dr. Heather Parity, who is a physician, a pediatrician with Children's Hospital of Wisconsin or Children's Wisconsin now. Um, and her focus is childhood lead poisoning prevention among many other things. But uh, she is a wonderful asset to our department and has really helped our team uh, with our COVID-19 response and providing medical direction. And then we have uh, Claire Evers, who is our uh, Deputy of Environmental Health and she was the Environmental Health Professional of the Year last year. Uh, she was also someone that um, also grew up in the health department and um, progressed and moved into the deputy commissioner role. And she's been a wonderful um, resource and asset, not only to the health department, to the community, really helping with these uh, COVID safety plans for restaurants and bars. Again, those were due last week on the 15th, and as of today, we've received 797 plans and 228 have been approved. We're still in the process of um, reviewing these plans, making adjustments, making sure restaurant and bar owners know what needs to be done to create a COVID safe environment. Um, and then we have Dr. Grizel Torres, who is our Deputy Commissioner of Policy, Innovation and Engagement. Um, and has significant experience in technology. She's been behind our electronic health record um, selection and system that we're getting ready to bring on board. Finally, we're moving away from paper, but this is gonna help us dramatically improve our ability to serve our community. And she also serves on the NATO Health Equity and Social Justice Work Group. So as the mayor noted, NATO also um, has been the organization that provided us with funding for our substance use disorder prevention or overdose prevention initiative, uh, Mori. And then we have Dr. Sanji Bhattacharya, who is our lab director and was our first special deputy commissioner. And he is right now <laughs> at the um, Association of Public Health Labs annual meeting. He is a board member for this organization and it's virtual, just like most other meetings right now. But he has been instrumental in really helping our um, health department uh, move ahead with different technologies related to um, investigating different types of um, viruses and genomics and all of these things. But uh, Dr. Bhattacharya's team also was extremely helpful with the initial access to COVID testing in our community. Um, our lab, again, was one of two uh, that went online in um, early March to be able to, to start testing for COVID-19. And we were providing a number of resources to the other health departments and as well as other healthcare um, entities in our community as they were getting up and going and uh, waiting to receive uh, the supplies to be able to run COVID-19 tests. So we also have the ability to do um, point of care rapid testing for COVID. So at the two community testing sites, the UMOS and Barack Obama, those are available there by request. Uh, we also provide this point of care rapid testing for severe high risk populations, congregate settings, and various underserved populations, as well as the city of Milwaukee employees. Um, since this deployment, 4,439 tests have been performed, and of those, 260 were identified as being positive, so it's a 6% positivity rate. The utilization of these point-of-care tests has allowed for rapid mitigation to prevent the spread of COVID-19 within these high-risk settings. So we were happy that we were able to step up and provide these supports due to Dr. Bhattacharya's leadership. There's so many things that um, we're doing as a health department, and I'm very happy that I'm leaving this department in a better place than it was when I received it. Um, there is also going to be a lab video that will be available today to just showcase what our health department lab is able to do. So we just wanted to put that together again to highlight um, all of the available um, using your tax dollars, um, and that is a benefit to our community. So uh, with that being said, um, 
Marlena Jackson was brought on board to be our Deputy Commissioner of Community Health. And she has been a wonderful uh, resource and asset and just a general um, wonderful human being <laughs> uh, to join the health department and her steady leadership, her perception, her maturity, her professionalism. She's uh, extremely sound in healthcare um, administration, which is also my background. And then I moved into public health, but Marlena's ability to support um, many of our community uh, programs and, and services has been wonderful. So, you know, I can't, uh, Go, I can go on and on about how wonderful Marlena is, but we're very happy that she's on board and that she's able to serve in the capacity of interim commissioner of health. So um, this again is the whole point of this reorganization is to create sustainability for the health department so that we don't have to go through what we went through in 2018 ever again. Um, we wanna learn from our mistakes and do better. So thank you, Mayor Barrett. Thank you, um, Milwaukee Common Council and thank you Board of Health for your uh, ongoing support of our rebuilding of the department. And thank you to all of the Milwaukee Health Department staff um, that are on board, those that have left and came back to help during COVID. It's like a big reunion. So we're very grateful for everyone uh, that has joined. And you know, again, even though I won't be here in this capacity, I will continue to look out and provide support from Washington. So I wanted to just formalize this exchange where I'm passing the badge to Commissioner Jackson for you all. But first, we're going to do it COVID style. So I have my sanitizer and I have my uh, wipes. <laughs> so um, if you did not know, uh, in public health, we have a term called a fomite. And a fomite is an inanimate object. And you can get disease from these things. So uh, the badge could be considered a fomite. And so I'm gonna sterilize it real quick before I give it to her. <laughs> but again, trying to model behavior here. So I got my wipe and I'm just gonna hold the badge, pick it up and write it down so that I'm all sanitized. <laughs> Should I have any hair on it? <laughs> okay, so. Here you go. Oh. So passing of the badge to Commissioner Jack. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner <laughs> Thank you. So now the floor is hers. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I um, want to first just introduce myself, Marlena Jackson, the interim commissioner of health now for the city of Milwaukee. Want to take this opportunity on behalf of the health department to thank you, Commissioner Kowalik. Yesterday, as we did our walkthroughs of different departments, you could feel the um, energy, you could feel the appreciation for all that you've done um, for all of our individuals here within the health department, as well as what you have done for the city. So you will truly be missed. Um, we are grateful that we've had an opportunity to know her. We're grateful that the city has had an opportunity to have her leadership. And we know that she's going to go on and do great things and we'll um, continue to wish her well and um, only wish the best for her. So with that said, I want to just um, share that as the interim commissioner, um, we are really going to continue to be focusing um, on short time frames um, of operational um, duties that as a health department we need to get done. So uh, we will spend, um, my goal over the next 90 days is to continue to move forward in our COVID response, whether that be staffing for our contact tracing and our case investigations, as well as our gating criteria and new orders. As you've heard a number of times on this uh, call today, we know that our cases um, overall are on the rise. So we will continue to monitor that very closely. And as those numbers um, continue to move in either direction as a health department. We're going to be prepared to um, work with our city attorney's office and the mayor's office to uh, make whatever changes or updates to the order to make. In addition to that, um, we'll also be focusing on the testing transition. Um, moving forward, the overall community testing um, strategies, as well as want to just make sure that we are focusing um, on some of the basic public health 
measures of immunizations as we move into the fall. We um, are working on our immunization clinics now and we'll get that information out. And um, then lastly, making sure that a lot of the internal work that the commissioner was instrumental in starting that we continue that in regards to making the health department a place where people want to work, where people are proud to work um, with by creating some internal um, some internal efficiencies as well as some engagement activities that we know work in regards to improving overall engagement. So I am super excited to take the role. I understand it's a heavy lift. I understand I have huge shoes to fill, um, but I am uh, very excited and um, I think I will turn it over now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Kowalik and Commissioner Jackson. Up next, we have Valerie Vidal, President and CEO of Meta House. Thank you so much. Thank you to County Executive Crowley and to Mayor Barrett for the opportunity to be here. Um, welcome to Interim Commission Commissioner Jackson and best of luck to Commissioner Kowalik. I'm so happy that we had a chance to meet Commissioner Kowalik when she was in this role. We're really excited to work with Commissioner Jackson um, going forward into the future. Thank you for giving Meta House the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, I'm going to be joined by our uh, program director for our outpatient program, who will share some resources after a few introductory comments um, from me. I'm Valerie Vidal, as mentioned, I'm the president and CEO here at Meta House. Um, for those of you who don't know about Meta House or aren't familiar with us, as the mayor mentioned, we are a nonprofit that has been um, around in Milwaukee. We're located in the River West neighborhood, and we've been a resource in the community for over 50 years, serving women and their families who are struggling with substance use disorder and those who may be struggling with co-occurring mental health disorders. At Meta House, we have a residential treatment program, we have an outpatient program, and then we also have transitional housing for women who are in early recovery. Um, so as uh, County Executive Crowley mentioned, the stress of the pandemic has uh, weighed heavily and significantly on all uh, facets of our population. People are feeling isolated. They're feeling uncertain about their future. Uh, they're unable to gather with community in ways that had been the norm prior to the pandemic. Um, and while minimizing the spread of COVID-19 is of course of the utmost importance, the sharp decline in social interaction can have a really severe and negative impact on a lot of people, particularly for those who might be struggling with mental health. And it can be even more difficult for people who are also struggling with a substance use disorder. People may be more inclined to turn to unhealthy habits. Uh, Commissioner Qualic mentioned, you know, eating more during this time of isolation. And that's probably certainly true for a lot of people, but um, people who are struggling with substance use may turn to other unhealthy and often fatal habits if they don't have more healthy outlets. Um, we objectively know that substance use um, at home is up since the start of the pandemic. People are drinking alcohol at, at a much sign more significant rate over prior years. A recent report from Nielsen showed that retail alcohol sales is up over 54% in late March compared to the same time period in 2019. And unfortunately, that similar trend can be found when you look at opioid use. Um, as uh, County Executive Crowley mentioned, and as Dr. Weston mentioned, um, preliminary numbers show that suspected overdoses in Wisconsin are up significantly. In fact, they um, are an, at an increase of 117% since the start of the pandemic over prior years. Um, there were 325 suspected overdoses uh, from March to July 13th of 2020, compared to the 150 suspected overdoses during that same time period in 2019. Year to date, over 225 of those individuals who lost their lives to an overdose were our neighbors here in Milwaukee County. Um, and if this trend continues, unfortunately, the medical examiner is expecting that 514 people will lose their lives to overdose by the end of this year. And we're not alone, trends are up um, across the country. But if we don't course correct, uh, we could be looking at exceeding the number of overdose, overdose deaths in the state of Wisconsin by over 100 over 2019. 
So um, I want to just I want to end on a slightly more positive note as I turn it over to Sarah Joyce, who is our um, program manager for outpatient pro for our outpatient program. And I want to say that um, Meta House is here as a resource. And while we've had to adjust our operations to account for um, safety and health during the time of COVID, there is hope, and we want to make sure that everyone who's in this meeting leaves knowing that there are resources still available to people, their loved ones who might be struggling with substance use. And I also wanted to mention that it's a recovery month. So here at here at Meta House, we're actually celebrating people who are in early recovery and who are on their path to obtaining recovery. And so with that, I'd love to turn it over to Sarah Joyce, who's going to talk about how you can access Meta House and other resources to get um, to get resources that you need to struggle um, for those who are struggling with substance use. Thank you, Valerie. So um, there are various ways that people can access services for substance use treatment. Uh, you can start with calling your own insurance provider, but otherwise anyone who's a Milwaukee County resident can reach out to 211 to be connected to different treatment providers here in the city. There's also Milwaukee County access points where people can be assessed to determine what services that you could benefit from. Here at Meta House, as Valerie mentioned, we have a residential treatment program. And unfortunately, there is always a wait list for that service, but we do encourage people to participate in outpatient or day treatment until residential can become available to you. And to find out more about our programs, you can go to our website, www.metahouse.org, or contact us at 414-962-1200. And we'd be happy to help anyone learn more about Meta House services in particular, or to help you navigate the systems. We know that when people are starting their journey to figure out what services they need, that it can be difficult and overwhelming, whether you're seeking services for yourself or for a family member. So we'd be happy to help you navigate those systems. Uh, I also just want to mention that uh, right now Meta House has adjusted our services that we are providing our outpatient services over telehealth in order to be cautious during this time. But uh, we also know that telehealth can be difficult. So our staff will also help make sure that you understand how to use the telehealth system in order to get the most benefit from your treatment services. And I was also asked just to mention a few additional tips with ways to cope during this time. In addition to what the commissioner mentioned with making sure that we're getting adequate sleep and nutrition, it's also important that we all have regular routines. Having solid routines health, uh, helps us all develop healthy habits and can reduce our stress level overall. It's also important to make sure that we're getting regular exercise to reduce that stress spending time outdoors while we still can, and also making sure that we're having either virtual or socially distant contact with our loved ones. It's important that we all feel connected at this time, as well as practicing different mindfulness techniques for ourselves. 